Now, if you're concerned about the profound impact that mass immigration is having on this nation and its communities, I invite you to uh, attend an important New Culture Forum conference on immigration that we are holding in London on Saturday the 7th of October. Now, we are bringing together leading experts and other notable and well-known voices who will speak openly, candidly and honestly about the problems arising from mass immigration and why the government seems incapable of controlling it. So, I very much hope you'll join us at this crucial conference. Tickets and further information are available in the description below this video, as well as on Eventbrite and via our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. And remember, NCF members get discounted admission. Thank you, and I hope to see you there. You're watching Deprogrammed. This is the New Culture Forum's latest show, committed to fighting back against the forces of ideological conformity, particularly among the young. My name is Harrison Pitt. I'm a senior editor at the European Conservative, and I'm thrilled to be joined today, as ever, by Evan Riggs, who is a freelance journalist, and our special guest this week, Nima Parvini, author of The Populist Delusion, and most recently, The Prophets of Doom. Now, I think you're probably best, it's probably fair to say that you're best known, Nima, for The Populist Delusion. But many of our viewers, I suspect, um, will be surprised by a title like that. You know, they're mm -hmm. often encouraged to think that populism is the, is the solution to our ails. Um, why do you think they're wrong? Um, well, I mean, it, I uh, first really kind of uh, started becoming more vocal about politics around 2016. There was this moment, of course, of Brexit and of Trump in America. And I remember the discourse online around that time and, and kind of more generally uh, speaking on the popular side of things. There was this idea that um, all it's going to need to take is to wake enough people up and then there will be a inevitable tipping point where there are so many people who are against what's happening and against, uh, broadly speaking, the, the powers that be um, that it will be inevitable that there will be this kind of bottom-up momentum mm. that will, you know, uh, rewrite the kind of correct the course of history. Mm. Um, and I think that this, when you really start to analyze this idea, it uh, is drilled into us in school. I mean, I remember back in, uh, when I was doing uh, GCSE history and A-level history, uh, we did modules on, you know, Martin Luther King and mm -hmm. civil rights or uh, Gandhi and Indian mm -hmm. independence. And all of these things are presented to you as if they are bottom-up organic movements um, where there's an uprising and that is enough, basically, mm. to make uh, elites do as you wish. Uh, unfortunately, that is just a myth. It's a narrative. Um, if you look at those specific ones that I mentioned, mm. Martin Luther King or Gandhi, they both had elite support. They were both uh, an organized minority. Uh, they did not have majority opinion on their side. No. Um, and really, this is the lesson of all of, all of history, really, which is that power lies in the organized minority, not in the disorganized mass. Mm -hmm. The organized 100 will always defeat the disorganized 1,000. Um, the, pr probably the easiest thing uh, for anybody who hasn't read Populist Illusion to get their head around, think of, the, think of an army. There's no army in the world that decides that they're going to, uh, you know, they're not going to have a top-down command structure mm -hmm. with a general and a sergeant and, and a privates. An anarcho-syndicalist army has, yeah. has, has never existed. <laughs> we're going we're to, we're you know, we're going to devolve power down to the privates and ask yeah, the squaddies yeah. what they want to do. Yes. That just doesn't happen in any army. It also mm -hmm. doesn't happen in any society. Um, and the reason that's important to understand, and I think that by this point in 2023, it's quite obvious to a lot of people who are politically engaged, um, what we call the left, um, or the political left, uh, I mean, I would include <coughs> many aspects of what people think of the, as the political right in that as well, by which I mean the, you know, uh, the establishment parties. Mm -hmm. uh, they are very much an organized minority mm -hmm. who p consistently and persistently ignore public opinion. Um, in fact, I start populist delusion with a study that was done in uh, Chicago where they looked across 
thousands of policy decisions um, and they found uh, a near zero correlation between public opinion and what <laughs> governments actually yeah. do. Yes. Um, and of course, anybody who watches this channel will know that in the British case, public opinion has almost always been against uh, mass immigration, for example, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the organized minority, by which I mean the British ruling class, the elites, have always steadfastly supported it. Mm. Um, you know, you can go right back to Enoch Powell, who was, you know, wherever you make of him, he had public opinion on his side. Uh, I think it was over 60%. It was 75%. Uh, 75%. Yeah. Um, According to polls. Uh, and what happened there, that didn't actually propel Powell into power. No. It didn't mean that Powell got his way. He was outmaneuvered and outflanked by the organized minority who kicked him out of the party, mm. uh, blackened his name in history, and, you know, the organized minority won. It's interesting so. that you mentioned the, the history, the curriculum as well, because you're, you're quite right that the, the, these, so for example, Gandhi's quit, quit British Quit India campaign and the Martin Luther King Civil Rights campaign, you're right to say that these, these were not, properly speaking, um, the sort of dis, di, distributed mass movements, but the ones which are romanticized in history are the, also the ones that have failed, which also proves your point. Like the Chartists and the Levellers are, are sort of common fixtures on the British history curriculum. It's never really mentioned that precisely because they weren't, because, yeah. because they were just sort of mass distributed and, organisms, they didn't succeed as movements. And even, um, even the, I mean, even Magna Carta, which I think oh my, that, yes. you know, if you actually look at Magna Carta, that was an organised counter elite and the people who got their own way in that. Yes. It wasn't this kind of, you know, uh, peasant uprising. Not at all. It was, you know, they were an organised elite who had power and leverage and uh, essentially they, you know, correctly at that time put a check on the king's power. Mm. But, and ex but expanded their own in the process. I mean, I can't remember which article it was, but I think it was Article 25 of Magna Carta, the, the original one, the 1215 mm. one, which actually ended up plunging England into civil war precisely because you know, it, 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 there was so little trust between the barons and King John. Um, but the barons wanted a, a baronial council of 25 people, of 25 of, of, of among their own number, not among the people, 25 among their own number who would try and hold the king to Magna Carta and would be the exclusive interpreters of it, and whether or not he had... Um, violated it and if he did violate it the, the clause said we we, we we claim the rights to seize your castles to declare war on you all these things it goes to yeah it goes to show that most peasants had no idea what was going on in 1215 and um i mean just to come back a bit closer to the modern, 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 modern day if you have a look i mean especially this has been the case in america but it also happens here mm. often what uh the elites will do the ruling the ruling elites um is that they will actually change the law first and they will wait for public opinion catch to catch up with the law, right? And you can see this in America time and time again. Mm. Before the Civil Rights uh, uh, Act in the, in the 60s, there are a whole set of Supreme Court rulings, uh, the Brown v. Board of, Board of Education, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that is something that is a mechanism that they use. You know, people have got a... Um, what do they call it? They have a bias towards whatever the status quo is. Yes. So if something, especially in this country, Britain has always been a very law abiding country. Mm -hmm. So if something is actually against the law, mm -hmm. it's much more likely for somebody then to, um, uh, somebody to support it. And every, now everybody talks about woke, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about woke. But in my, in my mind, what's really happening is the culture is catching up to laws that were passed by uh, successive governments, including Tony Blair's, and indeed uh, as a, the parting gift to the nation that Gordon Brown gave us, which was the Equality Act of 2010. Yes, helped by the Conservatives. Uh, well, of course, of, and of course, at every single time, mm. uh, the Conservatives, I mean, expanded, if you read enough history, you'll see the con Conservatives uh, have been often complicit in, uh, in, in, in most of these kind of radical changes that have happened. Um, in fact, there's an argument to say that the Tories are responsible for all of the bigger shifts, like expanding the franchise. <laughs> uh, I mean, now they champion it on their website, you know, yeah. we, ex we repeal the corn laws, we yeah, expanded yeah. the franchise, yes. but you have to remember that at every stage, that was a betrayal of their own base. Massively. Um, and I think that 
Uh, I mean, Cameron was one version of it, and I, I honestly think that... Yeah, there's a direct line of descent between the repeal of the Corn Laws and gay marriage, perhaps. Mm. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Cameron was just, mm. in, in his own way, continuing continue <laughs> conservative tradition. Yeah. This dovetails nicely with a concept that I'd love for you to explain to our viewers. What does it mean to put woke away? Right, I mean, th this is a... Um, this is a... How can I put this? Uh, I believe that uh, the especially the British ruling class, have always been experts in what I call containment, mm. okay? Um, that is, they'll push and they'll provoke as far as they can, mm. and then uh, at certain times they, they either pull back or they make certain concessions to their ostensible opposition in order to deflate it, in order to take the energy away, the dissident energy away, um, and therefore they gain control over it. Um, one example I would give in pre pretty recent history was the, I mean, speaking of Tony Blair, the march against the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. I think it was the biggest march in history and over a million people. Yeah. Now, I remember at that time, the left thought they'd had a tremendous victory. This is the, you know, we have seen the biggest protest ever, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that Tony Blair won again. Uh, 2005. Yeah, they didn't. Yeah. They didn't pull out of, <laughs> of Iraq at that time. Mm. Um, all that happened was is that by giving the protesters that victory, it drew it, it drained the energy out of the anti-war movement. Tranquilized it a bit. And, and tranquilized yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, uh, given where we are, I'm trying to be respectful, <laughs> but I think that. <laughs> A similar thing happened with Brexit, I'm afraid, mm -hmm. which was that Brexit had all of this energy mm -hmm. um, and it was very easy, I think, for the Tories to, who are they're just masterful at this sort of stuff, to take that, strip the energy out of it, take whatever was radical mm -hmm. away from it mm -hmm. and repackage it as, oh, actually, what, re what, what Brexit really means is being more global and less racist. <laughs> Uh, actually, it means more immigration. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, as so long as it's Indian immigration and African immigration instead of exactly. Immigration, actually, yeah. Brexit is against European racism. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm not making this up. This is literally what they did. No, no. Um, and you know, this is again classic containment. Sure. Now, at the moment, woke, what is called woke, has become pretty unpopular. I think. I think it's not popular with Tory voters. Obviously, I don't really think it's popular with a lot of. Labour voters mm. who are, lots of them are old school socialists, they're working class, they don't care about mm. issues like, you know, transgender bathrooms and things like this. They want, you know, they're looking at their pay packet or mm. they're wondering why, you know, the price of milk has almost doubled or why, you know, why it costs almost 80 quid to fill up your car now and why everywhere is, a, you know, why the country really doesn't seem like it's going in a very good direction, mm -hmm. whether you're left or right, Indeed. this is what you care about. Um, and again, speaking of Tony Blair, he was also a master of this, of basically saying the sorts of things that um, somebody who wouldn't like woke would support mm. in order to get, you know, in order to kind of put that issue away, take the energy out of it. Um, and I think, I mean, these things take time but I think that there will be a, we'll see a move on behalf of the government and on behalf of the Labour Party to try to put some of these culture war issues to bed for a little while so it's less in your face in order to contain the energy and to, and to uh, stop anything truly radical. I see. From so I just need to understand because yeah. I have not heard this concept before. So yeah. uh, this isn't something that you are recommending that we do. This is something that you, you're predicting the Labour Party will do. And, and you think <clears> that that will... Do you, do you think that, is, is it a question of them putting a polite face on these things? And so they'll happen anyway, but they just won't be as noisy? Well, I mean, I think it's, I think it's uh, worth remembering what life was like in the 1990s, for example, right? Mm. I call it going back to Fresh Prince. Sure. You know, I watch the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Oh, I see. Um, <laughs> there are, yeah, you know, I like Will Smith mm. and Uncle yeah. Phil, uh, and therefore I'm not racist. Because I watched that TV show. And John Barnes in England. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and, 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 I, and I listened to World in Motion yeah, with John Barnes. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and therefore, there's nothing to worry about because uh, the race issue has gone away. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, and it was under that cover that 
the Blair regime, if, I mean, I remember living in that time. It was a very politically incorrect time. There was the laddism, there was the new football thing that was going on. You know, there was kind of casual... The Sun, the sun the banter, tab tabloid press. You know, headlines. that was kind of like, that was the reality of Blair's Britain. But mm. under the hood of when that was happening, mm. he was passing all of these, you know, Ofcom and uh, the Communications Act of 2003. Hurling, hurling the borders open. All, all yeah. of those things happened mm. there. Um, what's happened since in the what we call woke is the fact that those things that they always stood for are now in your face. Now you've got some like critical race theorist or somebody telling like telling you like if you don't support this you're racist type of thing. People don't like that. It's a very bad persuasion tactic. And um, Bl Blair's argument has always been, and he says this quite openly. Really? He's saying it like he's probably saying it a few streets away right now in a conference <laughs> somewhere. Um, look, the important thing is power, right? Mm. We need power. Corbyn put the country off because he sounded too radical. Right. Mm. What you need to do is to sound sensible, sound like a sensible centrist, <laughs> gain power, then you can, you know, I see. do all the things that Peter Hitchens talks about in that book that you've got there, so yeah. Could you explain that concept of sen sensible centrism as well? Mm -hmm. you, uh, you didn't yeah. coin that, did you? <laughs> no, no, I, no I, I, I did not. Don't, no one wants to take credit for <laughs> sensible centrism. I, uh, um, it will surprise you to learn that I did not uh, invent the concept of sensorism. Um, uh, yeah, that was again uh, a kind of special tactic of the left, where uh, someone like Bill Clinton or Tony Blair, mm -hmm. they talk about, uh, you know, you don't want to present yourself as a radical. You want to present yourself as the adult in the room, right. the mm -hmm. sensible person in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I mean, for various reasons, I think that uh, people on the right should think about that as well. I don't mean Tory politicians, I mean, you know, people who are a bit more radical. It's probably not the best thing to do to walk into a room, you know, uh, <laughs> saying things that are going to make you seem like a lunatic to a normal person. You have to sure. present yourself, I think, in a sensible way. It's just basic persuasion stuff. Yeah. Let me, let me just ask a question. So I certainly would agree that, um, and in many ways, I think, I think, uh, it's only really since then, arguably the 19th and the 20th century, that people haven't thought in this way about politics. I mean, before the democratic ethos set in, there was always an understanding that it was fundamentally the, the elites which made politics. Even the American founding fathers thought this, particularly uh, James Madison. But it does seem to me that th th though the people are, the people as a whole are less politically uh, important as agents than this, as you, what you call the organised elite minority. They're not Play-Doh. I mean, you, you, there's, you can only go so yeah. you, can, you can only go so far in trying to shape them. And if you're trying to get the people to believe things that are, are fundamentally mm. against human nature, and that woke progressivism does this to an astonishing extent, uh, you, is, there, is there not some energy in populism that can be harnessed? Yes, by, 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 a, by, by a reaction. It has to be harnessed, yeah. of course. Yes. I, I think I think it's. I, mean, I, I give an example in the populist illusion um, where I talk about. Uh, imagine. Uh, student campus, right, a, a mm. university. Now, most normal students aren't interested in student politics. Mm. They spend their time drinking and trying to get off with each other or whatever, whatever else it is that <laughs> students do, right? They're eating beans and waking up at 1 p.m. or whatever. Yeah. Um, but if the student union decided, who are an organized minority, mm -hmm. and they get their way 99% of the time, right? But if the student union decided, right, we're going to ban meat from all of campus. Mm -hmm. Exactly. My exactly. student union yep. actually did try to do this, by the way. Yeah. yeah. And at that point, people who wouldn't normally take notice would be like, right, now mm. you're really impinging Great on, mm. on us. So people who wouldn't usually be involved in politics mm. would quickly get organized, quickly run for whatever the student union mm. uh, politics is. Look, we are we're just going to run on this issue. We're against this. Yes. And you'd see a circulation of elites within on the campus. Yes. Uh, pretty quickly in well, that scenario. Also, yeah. I mean, we, so we had Matthew Goodwin on the on the on the mm -hmm. show fa fairly recently, and he released some polling. Ever might know it better than than, than I do, but. Uh, because I can't remember all the details, but it, it goes to show that like tolerance in the general population for a lot of so-called pro woke progressive talking points, particularly on gender and race, have become more unpopular yeah. among people in the last five years, which does suggest that there is a that, that, that there is a genuine. So the the idea that you, 
it can, it can be true that by passing a law, another good example might be the death penalty. This is one of those things that was just passed mm -hmm. without people being consulted. Gay marriage is another one and pop, public opinion catches up. It doesn't always necessarily catch up. Sometimes it does do a bit of a U-turn because it, 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 it gets real, so to speak. And that seems to be happening a little bit. At well, least. I mean, I, I do think that woke ideology is one of the least competent ruling ideologies in history. I mean, it, it, it literally just provokes people to be against to be against them. Mm. And, you know, the whole tactic of cancellations and so on, mm. this does not actually make you a reformed citizen. <laughs> this actually just makes you want to fight them more. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's almost like kind of perfectly negative persuasion. Mm. It, it's just awful, you know, it's, mm. it's bad. Um, and this is why I believe that somebody in the ruling class at some point will come to their senses and think, we need to go back, whatever it was that Blair was doing back in 97, that was much better messaging than what we're doing now. Mm. And I, I mean, Keir Starmer, you know, it's taking time, but he is trying to do that. You know, he's been purging Corbyn Easters and he has been, you know, talking about immigration. Now, of course, none of us believe him, yeah. but you understand what I'm saying, it's right? Sen yeah. Sensible centrism is more dangerous than the blue haired girl at Yale. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. and uh, uh, yeah, Blair is more dangerous than Corbyn yeah. for this reason. Yes. So this, this is, containment and the modern variant of it would be called putting the work away. Hmm. So returning back to kind of myths that you learn as a child that seem to stick around long after they've been disproved, I, I want to talk about the myth of progress, mm -hmm. which is kind of the subject of uh, the prophets of doom. And this idea that things are always and forever getting better and that we're basically the only goal that we have is to be on the right side of history, right, as things kind of inevitably make their way to a kind of egalitarian, socially liberal state. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, a, a delusion that a lot of people, even on the right, still believe in. But the big kind of splintering between what we might call the new right or the dissident right um, and everybody else, I think, is maybe a embrace of somewhat Machiavellian policies, um, but also the, the rejection of, what's it called, Whig history? Isn't that it? The Whig interpretation of history. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, why, why are so many people still attracted to this idea, even when it goes against exactly what they claim to be for? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I do think that there are a lot of people who have uh, what you might call an optimism bias or hope bias. Yes. Um, and uh, you, can, you can even see this, um, for example, on, on YouTube. There are, some, there are some channels, I won't name them, who uh, they basically, they're, they're kind of like... Uh, Trump channels, you know, they're MAGA channels. But according to them, CNN is always imploding. Oh, Liberals yeah. are always losing. Yeah. <laughs> it's always Biden's worst day. Yeah, you, yeah. You want, you want, we're you always know, so back. Yeah, right, yeah. we're always, it, Trump is always smug and winning, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, reality is he's facing what, you know. 91 like, indictments. 91 indictments, 91. you know, sending his allies to jail and so on. And, and so I do think there are some people who just have an optimism bias, mm. right? Um, and obviously the ultimate version of that is this progressive history or Whig history. Mm. Um, I, I also, th how can I put this? There are certain policies, uh, hard tangible policies that various governments have put in place that actually have growth as an inbuilt assumption, mm. right? Um, mm. You know, so there's a practical reason for it as well. Um, however, Everybody knows. I mean, what? As I was coming here today, I went uh, had a coffee before I came, and I noticed that on the on the uh, toilets of uh, the Pret a Manger, the cafe there, there was a padlock, and I had to have a code to get into the to the loos. Mm. I didn't have to do that when I was ten years ago when mm. I used to work in, or fifteen years ago. That didn't used to be there. Clearly, there's less trust now yes. than there mm. was ten years ago. I remember as a kid, people used to tell me, oh, well, back when I was little, we used to just leave the doors open, mm. you know, because it was a high trust society. So it's called social capital, isn't it? That's a technical yeah. term for it. Yeah, yeah right. uh, because things were safe. People may have had less money overall, mm. but there was a genuine community there. Mm -hmm. And if somebody transgressed, somebody did try to steal from someone, they'd be socially ostracized mm. in a lot of towns in this country. Mm. Um, and I think that, I mean, there's many different ways to prove the point. You know, one of the ways to prove the point is just by looking at crime statistics, for example. You know, 
is the uh, per 100,000 crime rate higher today than it was in 1950? Yes. In fact, it was also higher than it was in the 1930s, where mm. the Great Depression. The depression. Right? Well, that's progress of a kind. Right. So, I mean, okay. Yes, um, it also goes to show that poverty doesn't necessarily cause crime. Right. I mean, it showed, like, the, there are lots of myths. People, oh, well, poverty is the reason, or it's uh, exactly. social inequality. Well, how do you explain the fact that there were fewer murders in Victorian yeah. London than there yeah. were now? I mean, you can take, you can take some, uh, you know, if you're, on, if you're watching this on YouTube, after watching this, you, there's lots of... Uh, videos you can pull up of London in, let's say, 1900 or 1930 or 1950. Mm -hmm. And um, with technology now, they can colorize. Yes. They can colorize those. I would uh, ask anybody to watch some of those videos and then think about London today and ask, like, it is really what we have now a, uh, an improvement mm -hmm. on that or on that or on that? Um, so these are kind of some, I would say, very superficial ways of proving mm. the point. Um, in this book, in Prophets of Doom, I survey a number of thinkers, uh, 11 of them, who uh, have a, a much deeper understanding about the shape of history, and um, they almost kind of give an alternative way of thinking about history, um, which has a much longer history than the than the Whig than the Whig version, which or, or other versions of or, or unidirectional sure. history. The Whig yeah. version is just one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they give they give an alternative to progressive history, which I think that people have an intuitive under anyone who has an understanding of history has an intuitive understanding that you know the Ro Rome did not keep on going at the line of of Rome didn't keep on going up and up. Mm -hmm. Right, It rose and then it fell. The British Empire rose and then it fell. Mm. Now we're in the American Empire, which had its rising motion. And I think, we're, you know, it's not that controversial to say we're living through its decline right now. I, you know, what's funny is that um, that recent kind of whatever discourse about how often men think about the Roman Empire that was just running through Twitter and everything. I thought that was so revelatory about the fact that maybe kind of unconsciously or in an in insophisticated way, people realize the same thing is happening to this civilization as to Rome. And so they're looking back to kind of learn the lesson of a falling, falling empire. So in the mm -hmm. conclusion of, of this book, you lay out these kind of 10 key points for it. And I think it's number seven that says, you know, the children of winter can't be, was it the men of spring or the children of spring? Can you, can you explain what that means for us? Because I think what we would all agree on is that we are now kind of living through the winter. Mm -hmm. Why can't we become springtime men? Well, um, I think, I mean, I try to be realist uh, in all the stuff that I write. And, you know, there are aspects of this book when people read it, they're going to find sobering. They're going to find, uh, you know, some of them may find it depressing or pessimistic. But actually, I think it's more, I, I actually think it's liberating to understand where you are in history what is possible and what is not possible. Um, I think a lot of people, when they first uh, start becoming aware of what's happened um, over the past 70, 75 years since World War II and the trajectory that we're on, um, you know, there's two possible, one set of people might uh, despair, but there's a much more natural reaction, which is like, we must be able to do something about it. We're mm -hmm. going to be able to fight them. We're going to mm -hmm. be able to defeat them politically. Mm -hmm. um, Quickly, you realize just how much you're up against, just how much uh, material, resources, institutions, power, organization, the, uh, the current elites have. Um, so in order to overthrow that, it's not, I mean, you're not going to just be able to set up a political party and vote yourself, get yourself voted in. Um, you know, that's an, that's an obvious uh, solution that people come up with. I think we're seeing in America mm. realities of what that actually looks like. These people are prepared to put you in jail. It's the most pyrrhic of victories. Right. Yeah. They are prepared to do whatever it takes to get a victory. So uh, what people talk about, and in fact, this has been in the news recently as well, because uh, <coughs> I saw a Guardian article a couple of days ago, you know, the right is talking about Caesarism was, the, was yeah. the article, right? But realistically, that has been the historical answer to, you know, uh, Thomas Carlyle, who's one of the authors I talk about, mm -hmm. you know, 
when an elite goes rotten, mm. there has to come a cleansing fire. A rejuvenating figure. You know, yeah. whether it's Cromwell or Napoleon or one of these figures, sure. right? Now, speaking of our school education, this is something that sends chills and quivers down yeah, the spine. Because we're, because we're only allowed to believe in structural forces that right. shape history. Liberals love, I mean, the liberal version of history is almost like your Forrest Gump drifting along, you know, drifting along by currents. Yeah. If you listen to a Tony Blair speech, the future is inevitable. And we, the only choice we have is to get on board with it, mm. right? That's, that's the way he sure. talks, right? So it's almost this kind of, they don't like the idea of a great man, okay? Because a great man is necessarily corrective rather than going with yes, the flow. And, and yeah. but also a great man embodies different, like a kind of heroic spirit, um, whereas the liberal order really kind of mitigates against that. It doesn't want it's more conformist. this sort of figure, right? Yeah. And if you think about a lot of the enemies of the liberal order, yeah. they tend to be kind of strong men figures, whether it's, uh, you know, going right back to World War Two, whether it's Hitler or Stalin or uh, Saddam Hussein or whoever else, they always can't, or currently it's Putin, right? Mm -hmm. um, they always cast the uh, that as being a kind of uh, an ultimate evil, mm -hmm. if, if you want. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that the only thing that's going to kind of sort things out is going to be a figure like that. And I truly, in my heart of hearts, believe that somebody, like people like us, I mean, I, I, the joke I make is, I grew up watching like Thundercats and He-Man and, you know, Euro Trash and... These are all words to me. I don't know uh, what I, don't I mean. Know what I'm you never heard of Thundercats? I kind of... Uh, <laughs> I, I kind of... Uh, I, 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 Sounds I, like a wholesome childhood. You know, I, yeah. I just grew, I grew up in a time of, all right, well, Coca-Cola and McDonald's. And oh, I see, yeah, yeah. You, you understand. Yeah. You, you kind of... That was my like. That was the world I grew up into, and we were taught to be kind of cynical and watch Backadder and stuff. To try to embody that sort of heroic spirit coming from that sort of background yeah. is basically not possible, right? Because in order to embody these sorts of things, you almost have to become fanatical in a way that is already deconstructed by the likes of us. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. So it's almost like we're too cynical. It's almost like we're we're not able to, we're too educated, we're too civilized yes. in order to become those people. Yes. So historically what happened, what tends to happen is that those people arise out of genuine struggle and hardship. And we have not experienced that. I mean, a couple of cancellations and so on, but what does that mean? Mm. Oh, I can't post on Twitter today. That's not hardship, right? I mean, if you, if you want to go back to, um, you know, the Bolsheviks in Russia, these guys were in and out of jail for 20 years. Sure. Or, you know, in Germany, the, uh, you know, the people who became Hitler's regime, they all suffered through World War One. Mm -hmm. They were on yeah. the losing side of a war. They all served. They were in the trenches. Um, we haven't had anything like that. And the people who will, will actually come out of those sorts of experiences, which we haven't had. But isn't, so, the, isn't the lesson yeah. of this, though, and we can use the example of Caesar here perfectly, because you call your book The Populist Delusion, and like, the, mm. I think many of the insights you make are, are incredibly shrewd and, and, and correct. But Caesar was himself a populist. For, for, but the, pop, the difference between him and many populists today is that he was willing to go from being a populist to being a winner, to being the, the, the elite. He didn't just want to be a transgressive, marginal figure outside the city gates forever. Like he was a populist when he crossed the Rubicon, but once he'd beaten Pompey and once he'd become dictator in perpetuity, he was yeah. happy to be an elite figure. And so is, is, is the lesson not so much that populism uh, it isn't the answer, but the, but the populism isn't the sole answer. It's it's a vehicle towards something rather than a destination in itself. Yeah. So I mean, it's not that I'm saying that the causes of populism are wrong necessarily. I'm just saying that the idea, the methods hmm. of populism being this kind of bottom up. To, you know, Julius Caesar was not a Democrat, right? It wasn't. A, he wasn't. A, it wasn't <laughs> a bottom up absolutely movement. Absolutely not. It was yeah. an elite but movement. Like, oh, well, uh, we, we, kind we, of, populism is not enough in and of itself. Um, but sorry, sorry yeah, can, I, can I just yeah. challenge that a bit? Yes. I mean, so I would certainly agree, like, yeah. Caesar was not a proto-democratic <laughs> figure, I'm aware, but, 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 and by populist, I don't necessarily mean that he's 
you know, com commanding a mass movement of <laughs> plebeians in order to, see, you know, storm mm. the Senate. But like, we're, we're talking about populist figures. These people are themselves, in a certain way, marginalised elites yes. who then mm -hmm. galvanise yeah. that energy for their own causes and, as they would mm -hmm. say, like for the causes of Rome as well, or whichever country it might be, Hungary, Britain, France. And so populism as a political tactic isn't, doesn't necessarily have to be naively democratic. No, no, I mean, in its, in its ethos. It's often, what it, often what has happened is that you get a Caesar-like figure who ally, who set himself up as a people's champion. Indeed. It's a people's champion against a rotten middle, right? Yes. High-low middle mechanism. Yeah, the, the, the Senate um, in this case. Or, yes. Yeah. Um, but also you have to realise that the they have their own high-low middle mechanism. So yeah. they set themselves up, our, our current elites, set themselves up as a champion of a kind of underclass mm. you know the, they, are, they are the champions of all the minorities yeah. uh, or of all of the uh, all of kind of history's outcasts mm. like the uh, you know the, it's, so the, it's a coalition the, of LGBT and you know this minority what, France, and minority France, what Fritz Fanon called the, the wretched of the earth those, those types of people right. yeah. so that's their high low middle mechanism mm -hmm. and they're attacking broadly speaking mm. the people in the middle um, and the, the kind of Caesar coalition, if you want, is somebody, and Trump in many ways embodies it, right? The trouble is, is that, to come back to your question, your, uh, your point about embodying being the children of winter, the image that I will always come back to, Bolsonaro in Brazil, mm. he had millions of people mm -hmm. out on the street begging him to cross the Rubicon, yep. and literally... He was sat in a KFC, taking selfies, <laughs> posting pictures of himself, eating fried chicken, right? <laughs> now, this is not the spirit of Caesar, <laughs> right? And, and <laughs> I mean, basically, it's because he's a boomer. He's a boomer. Let's, let's right. face it. He, yeah. and, and Trump, and, you know, as much as people may love Trump, um, I fear mm. that he just may have that same yeah. was, was caesar selling mugshot mer merchandise as well exactly yeah. so yeah. i want one of those shirts um <laughs> i really do um i'm trying to figure out how to get one imported into the uk yeah. um now can i ask you what might be a slightly provocative question but that when january 6th happened in america people basically said this is trump kind of dipping his toe into the rubicon he's pulled out and so it has to be punished massively mm -hmm. and i think too what people are seeing with elon musk who was just at the american border talking about repatriation of illegal Mexican immigrants into the U.S., is that the, the, the kind of blob or the superstructure that's against these kind of great men is punishing these figures not necessarily for standing against them, but for standing for something. It's the fact that Musk was not only willing to buy Twitter, but then also go in and fire 80% of it, that sends an example that something like this can actually be done. Mm -hmm. Like a, a bureaucracy can be cleared out in such a manner. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there is room for a figure in the UK like this to come up, or would they be crushed in a similar kind of way? Um, I mean, it, the, the, the truth is, is that all of these things at the end come down to will. That's, that's basically, it just comes down to how much do you want it? And how much do they want it? Um, and how much will does Elon Musk have ultimately when the forces come for him? Mm. And how much uh, will does somebody like Donald Trump have? Um, I, it, it's not that I'm uh, kind of pessimistic about these specific figures. I just think that their kind of instincts are still basically progressive and modern. Mm. They're not the, the, to be the true Caesar, if, if that makes any sense. Um, wh why the why the what we call the regime is terrified is because of course they're putting the idea in people's heads, and one of the things that could happen um, is that the next generations on, i.e., the people who are going to be, I mean, I'm not sure how old you guys are, but let's say like ten years younger than you again, mm. um, who have you know maybe had a bit more of that suffering, maybe the world the world is that much worse type thing. Um, and won't have all of these preconceptions that we have. Um, what, what I call uh, the boomer truth regime, uh, and I mean, this, this book and the populist illusion are kind of, it's a trilogy that is going to end up in the, 
next book is going to be called The Boomer Truth Regime, um, is basically a set of ideas and assumptions that people have internalised and kind of passively accept and don't even have to articulate most of the time. Uh, that you're taught from a very young age, you know, part of it is this bottom-up conception of the world, part of it is kind of de facto belief in progress, democracy being a great thing is another part of it. Um, and, you know, in with it comes like a, a natural fear of the great man, all these sorts of things, uh, various taboos that you're not allowed to talk about, mm -hmm. um, a certain kind of mythos around World War II that you're not allowed to touch, all of these sorts of things. Um, one possibility in the, in the near future is, frankly, that you get a generation of people who just, they don't know, like, they know so little know. that they don't have any of those preconceptions or taboos because they just like haven't been socialized it's true but it's true i understand what yeah. you're saying yeah. that you, it's e easier to work on so to speak. Mm. but but, they, but they've also had new preconceptions foisted upon them i mean i we we, we had this example mm. recently I, I'll, I'll raise it again because it's relevant mm. in the circumstances when you know the, the whole idea that british history has always had a, like a black <laughs> diverse from the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, diverse from the beginning, black from the start, all that sort of thing. Um, like my brother is, is currently 14, he's in school, and uh, he's been, been taught about 16th century history. Great, more people should be taught about 16th century history, it's very important. But he's not being taught proper 16th century history, he's being, talk, he's being taught about Henry VIII's sub Saharan black trumpeter, John Blank. <laughs> And when I asked him, do you know who Thomas Cromwell is? Do you know who Martin Luther was? Do you know who you know, uh, John Calvin was? He only knew who Luther was. And he didn't give, the, and despite being a very intelligent young, young boy, he didn't know a great deal about what, who Martin Luther was. He said, like, didn't he invent his own religion? That was his, was his response to me. Um, <laughs> well, he's not wrong. He's not wrong. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Well, he's slightly wrong, yeah. but no, it doesn't matter. I corrected him, so it's fine. He, he knows now. But in any case, this is the point. So if even someone like my brother, who's in a very sound familial environment, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> let me just say that. If even he is being saddled with new preconceptions, is, is that not also a cause for concern? Well, I mean, I, I believe that this ideology that you're talking about that's being foisted on your, on your brother is uniquely bad, right? Um, which is to say that it's, it, it's a, it's a lies are so absurd and so demonstrably untrue in, in many mm -hmm. cases mm -hmm. that... Um, it doesn't take that much to pull someone out of it, mm. okay? It takes a lot more. I, I mean, you give your brother to me for two weeks and he, he wouldn't... <laughs> Sign him up for like the courses. He, he would be, you know, yeah. he'd be set right quickly, okay? Yeah. But give me a boomer or give me someone who's grown up in okay. with these preconceptions and they are much more difficult to... They're, they're much more deep-rooted, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Whereas the woke stuff, I think, is kind of... Like, it's not difficult to say, well, look, here's a man, here's a woman. People have thought this way for no, hundreds but, of but years. But the one yeah. thing... I'm sorry, yeah, sorry. But yeah, one, the one thing on. I will say about that is I think that the different aspects of wokeism have different shelf lives. So I would mm -hmm. agree that the transgender stuff is probably is so yeah. indulgent and so evidently contrary to human nature and our, our instincts that it's, it's got something... And it's causing so much pain to young people and it's causing such a backlash among parents, it's going to be well, it's going to be a bit like the Iraq war. No one's going to be, in 20 years time, no one will say that they were ever in favor of it. Um, mm. uh, but I do think that some of the, 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 the racial identity politics stuff has a much longer shelf life precisely because of the demographic transformation, the ongoing demographic sure. transformation of our countries. And under those conditions, it's very possible that this sort of retrospective myth-making about Britain always being a, a country of immigrants will have staying power. I mean, Even though it's nonsense. I mean, the trouble, the trouble who, who, who is... Will say this? Well, this is what we talked about with Steve Edgington. That's already happened to a degree, I would say, in America. And I think oh. you're at risk of ha happening yes, in Britain. Yes, I, I, yes I mean, indeed. I, I mean, a lot of this stuff does come from America, if you ask me. Um, yep. But I, I, I just think it's much more difficult to do that with a country that has consistently written things down. Right. Mm. Um, and, I mean... I do recommend people buy books because they're t they're taking those off the, could, they're could, taking those out of uh, mm. libraries and so I mean many of my books are former yeah, library yeah. books but it I guess what I'm saying is it it wouldn't be that difficult to get the aforementioned footage of London from 1900 or 1950 mm. or even 1970 to mm. show the, that this version of history that they're trying to push 
is kind of a lie, mm -hmm. right? It's one thing to say America is a nation of immigrants because, you know, after about the first 80 years, that's kind of true. In this country, that is not, that is not really yeah, the case. So there's, there's two concepts that I yeah. really want you to explain to our viewers before yeah. we get out of here. And okay. on this topic of will and deep-rootedness, mm -hmm. what is Asabaya and what does it mean that civilization is incommunicable? Okay, um, so, so, so Asabaya um, is basically a kind of collective, uh, a kind of, it's the band of brothers, the willingness to, you know, be in a situation, we're going to go, go to war together, I'm going to die for you and you're going to die for me. Hmm. And, and you do this uh, based on um, Asabaya, uh, which is a, a kind of deep-rooted, in-group preference uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Think of like, I don't know, Genghis Khan and his men. Like the uh, Caesar and his men, or Caesar and his men, or mm. any any tight knit sort of sort of yeah, an, an, a non negotiable camaraderie yeah. between or, or the Bolsheviks, right? Mm -hmm. To give a, a left wing example In, until the nineteen thirties, which yeah. they, yeah. when yeah. they all started yeah. killing yeah. each other. I mean, I mean, this is usually before they're in power. And then after, after you <laughs> yes. know, once you've achieved power, you can kill yeah. each other yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But um, <laughs> the I mean, that is what that that is a kind of um, it comes from uh, medieval a philosopher called Ibn Khaldun. Hmm. Who wrote a, who wrote a kind of cyclical history, um, and uh, it's been updated by one of the prophets of doom that I talk about, Peter Turchin. Mm -hmm. He's still living, actually. He's one of the few who's still around. Uh, that's why I didn't put him on the front of the book because I maybe you wouldn't yeah. appreciate <laughs> having his uh, having his slide. mugshot there. Yeah. But um, next to Evola. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, there's the kind of Dracula like Evola, and it's like, oh, here's this modern academic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so <laughs> that is also an important concept to understand now, though, yeah. because I believe that certain uh, minority groups have this, hmm. um, both in this country and certainly in America. Uh, they have this. I think, for example, um, the African American community, through you know, they've had struggle, they've had hardship, they've got a kind of yep. collective mythos, um, they've got. Uh, you know, like uh, if you grew up in a social housing project, mm. you know, in Staten Island mm. or something. Like the, you the, know, the, the word the black experience doesn't make no sense. Well, I mean, yeah. I, I will just put it yeah. in like really yeah. blunt terms. Yeah. When I grew up, I didn't have a friend who was shot in the face. Yeah. Right. Whereas some people from those communities may have had that. Yeah. Mm. Okay. That changes somebody. Yeah. And I believe that some of those guys have this where they're kind of, they have this kind of collective solidarity. Sure. Um, that's important because I think that, uh, you know, certainly in this country, white British people do not have this. They do not have, and they're not encouraged to think of kind of collective solidarity in that sort of way. Actively discouraged, right? I would say. Actively discouraged, whereas it is encouraged for certain other groups. Hmm. Um, I also think that, I mean, currently we have Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister. Um, and I have been noticing a kind of um, triumphalism a, among a kind of a kind of Indian triumphalism. Yeah. Look at how many Indian CEOs there are. Uh, you know, when when he went over to meet Modi a few weeks back, you know, it was kind of celebratory. Very deferential be, be, because um, you know it is. It's just kind of human nature in a way to recognise. Well, this person's part of my group, and I'm proud of him for that. Mm -hmm. No, my dad. My dad is from Iran. I've seen it with his. Like uh, Iranians are. They have this kind of mm -hmm. inbuilt, oh, I recognize one of my own. Mm. I'll look out for him a bit more. Maybe, you know, maybe I'll give him a different, maybe I'll give him a cheaper price or whatever, you know. Yes. All other groups do this, but... Maybe I'll riot if he gets himself killed. You, know, you, you understand <laughs> what I'm saying, right? Yes. Other groups do this, and um, the, you know, the native population of Britain does not do this, and is thought of to think of themselves as an individual, yeah, yeah. right? This comes back down to the basic elite theory. The organized minority always triumphs over the disorganized mass. And if you always think of yourself as just one individual and as not as part of a group, the people who do think of themselves as a group will nope, defeat you win out. 10 times out of 10. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not even random. There's, no, there's just no chance mm -hmm. of winning out sure. uh, against another organized minority. So... Um, and the idea that civilization is incommunicable. And, and the idea that civilization is incommunicable, I mean, you know, to stick with the idea of Rishi Sunak, the example I would use is Justin Trudeau, when he went over to India and he wore the traditional dress and he 
you know, his wife put the sari on and so on. Mm-hmm. I mean, how? I mean, how much and how long would Rishi, uh, would Justin Trudeau have to do that before he became Indian and the people saw him as Indian? <laughs> Hmm. Okay. Well, I think his history of blackface has probably scuttled his chances there. <laughs> um, now, now, people like Spengler and some of the other people I talk about in this book would say that it doesn't matter if he did it for 300 years, hmm. everybody will recognize that Justin Trudeau is wearing borrowed clothes. He cannot embody the spirit of what it means to be that people because he's not hmm. that people. Hmm. It's just borrowed clothes. And that in time, his innate... Canadian us, whatever that is, would kind of reest- would kind of just come back to the fore because he cannot ever truly become the Indian he's dressing up as, and so it is with all groups essentially. Now that now I realise that is a very controversial idea to say in 2023, but this these things were seen as just self evident, obvious facts of life to all of these writers mm. and many other writers before about. You know, 50 years ago or something. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 there were a lot of um, sort of... Uh, Isaiah Berlin calls them counter-enlightenment philosophers in his in his work, or in his lectures at the series at least, but he, like, he talks particularly about, um, I think, uh, Herder, mm-hmm. particularly. He, like, he would say in the same way that, I think it's Spengler who says that civilization is incommunicable, or it might be someone else. But I, it, yeah. I think it's Spengler who says that. Um, but Herder would famously say that translation is impossible, that you can't mm-hmm. translate. And he would even talk about this among different European nations. He was sort of the philosopher of nationalism or proto-nationalism, at least. He would say, you can't translate Goethe into French without losing the, the spirit, the embodied spirit of Absolutely, Goethe, because it's, yeah. it's not primarily something, a transaction that takes place on a universal intellectual plane. It's the outgrowth of an organic essence, which can't be simply replicated by, mm-hmm. you know, by culture and that sort of thing. Whenever people come at me and say like these are like sort of um, ideas beyond the pale, I just like to remind them that you know in an American context, you know, I, would, I would maybe use D-Day, but in a British context, I would maybe say Dunkirk. Basically, everybody who set sail off in Dunkirk uh, believed in everything that you just said. So yeah, also, this used to be common sense. But also, the left believe it today. When True. when Lizzo says, "I twerk <laughs> because I am I'm twerk because I am black." This is an embodiment of my black spirit. A direct quote from Lizzo. What is she talking about? If not exactly this concept right here. Mm. Now, when those same people who would champion Lizzo for saying that, Mm. then see, I don't know, they look at a high school gym of a group of white women who are all twerking. Mm. Quite quite rightly, they will say, well, actually, that's cultural cultural appropriation because... You're you're trying to embody some borrowed clothes here. Yes. Right. Because mm-hmm. this is this comes from my people. The, the, the really, right? You understand? Absolutely. Yeah. But the really yeah. insidious thing about it is that like though though it's that the universalizing tendencies that that, that, we, that we've encouraged ourselves to think are universal over the past mm-hmm. to have wherever however you want to date it the last hundred years like th- there is a res- resurgence of tribalism that is clearly occurring in mm-hmm. advanced democracies but tribalism is only applauded from certain groups or other groups are sort of are forced to be universalist are forced to be mm-hmm. forced to be cosmopolitan but whereas otherwise everyone else no. is allowed to be a sort of mm-hmm. you know a fire-breathing ethnocentrist no, 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 to, <laughs> they to, want to, be. <laughs> to to say something a bit more kind of deeper point that may be a bit more troubling is that if you follow Speng- what Spengler's uh, saying and what some of these other writers are saying as well, but especially Spengler, he talks about the, the fact, he says the Europeans are the Faustian man, right? Mm. Um, and he sees a break between like the Romans and the, let's say the medieval knights. They're not actually the same people. They come from a kind of, uh, originally they come from Germanic, Germanic tribes and so on and so forth. Um, but the Faustian spirit does have this universalizing tendency and this kind of will to expand to inv- to include everybody, mm-hmm. okay, which which has a kind of conquering element, but it also has a kind of it has a kind of madness to it. And he talks about you know all of these writers talk about um, you know Pope Gregory the Seventh, for example, mm. who wanted to unite the entire globe under his mm. kind of religious z- z- uh, vision. Mm-hmm. And one of the very difficult things I grapple with writing this book. Um, is the, the realization at times is that maybe this kind of universalizing tendency is actually part of what European people are, mm. i.e., they were always going to have like some. So, in a, there's, there's a strange way in which the spirits of I don't know, like 
human rights and yeah. the current regime and so on. Not the woke part, yeah, yeah. but the kind of truly liberal part. Yeah, the mm-hmm. classical liberal part. Uh, yeah. the li- it's, it's just a rearticulation of many other types of universalizing ideologies we've seen before. Hmm. It's the spirit of Pope Gregory, if you hmm. want to put it that way. Or of, or of um, the Jacobins. Or, or, or of, or of yeah, whoever. Whoever and, it might be. And this, yeah. this kind of... I mean, I find it a little bit terrifying because it's truly great. I mean, it, it, it's like the, uh, it's like there's a weird crossover between many European leaders of the past, whether they're Holy Roman emperors or popes, yes. and somebody like Tony Blair today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had they kind of share that missionary zeal, and it makes them naive. Uh, it, ma- it makes them naive. Yes. but it also makes them like, you know, they're true believers. They truly believe that the entire the entire world can kind of conform to their template, mm. template and yeah. vision, yes. um, and I don't know what to do about that. It's just kind of. Well, n- n- yeah. n- <laughs> Nima, Nima Parvini, it's been a real privilege. It's so much more interesting than talking about the Tory conference, which is also going on at the moment. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you well, so much for coming onto the show. Low bar to set. Yeah, very low bar to set. Evan, thanks as ever. You've been watching Deprogrammed. Make sure to like, subscribe, leave a comment if you wish, and we shall see you on the next one. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as £3 per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free, just remember, to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.